talk about first order logic here. First, to understand um, what what is this about? Is about representing the language that we know in a way that a computer can do something with it. Okay, and the way in which we represent things is first order logic. It's a very specific way of representing them. There are many ways to represent language, many ways in which a computer can work with what we understand. This is one way. And the idea here comes from um, the representation of language is something that we don't know yet how it's done. We know that, for example, some communities determine different language categories, right? So for the same item, depending on the community, it can be in different categories. And some communities also define categories that other communities don't. Then also, we know that uh, since 1975 that the uh, people remember the content of what they read better than the actual words they read. So somehow they're storing this in some categories that, you know, they're not just storing every single word. People don't just understand every single word, but they understand an abstraction of those words. All right. Now, uh, and again, from 1956, we know that those abstractions may vary depending on cultural factors or individual uh, individuals. Now, also, in 2008, uh, people at Carnegie Mellon were able to predict with above chance accuracy the areas of the brain that would activate with, with certain words. So some words activate some areas of the brain. Perhaps the, the activation of those is how we represent language, right? But the one common thing is that the representation of language is abstract, it's not literal. So with that in mind, um, we know that we have, for example, we're going to choose a, a way to represent language, and it's going to be this. We know there are objects, cat, dogs, house, John, etc. We know the relations, so the cat has color, house has color. The house is bigger than, smaller than, it comes between, one comes between, zero and two, etc. These are relations that relate two objects together, or more than two objects together. And then there are facts, so which are one value for a given input. For, for example, um, uh, that X has a father, that John has a father, it's a fact, right? John has a head, it's a, it's a fact. John can swim, it's a fact, okay? And facts have a truth value. They're true or false. Uh, I can say, for example, uh, seven people died yesterday. That's a fact, right? It can be a false fact, but it's a fact. A relation could be that uh, Jeremy was the father of one of those people. That's a relationship, right? And then objects are the, the people and objects in question. <clears throat> there are uh, several kinds of representing uh, facts and things in in, um, in computer science and the language of propositional logic which we there, there's a bunch of videos um, earlier than this one about that they represent facts okay they recognize the world as facts and they have values that are uh, the, the agent can believe that they're true false or unknown in first order logic which is what we're going to talk today there will be facts objects and relations and the agent believes about those facts are going to be true, false, or unknown. There's other ways of representing language, and most interestingly, these last two here, in which in probability theory or fuzzy logic, there are facts, and sometimes with a degree of truth. So there is a, a, a probability of a fact being true and a probability of it being wrong. And sometimes there's a degree of belief in part of the agent. These are the subject of uh, probabilistic uh, and, and fuzzy logic, okay? Right now, we're going to look at this one. All right, so let's look at these objects and relations, for example. We have uh, Richard here is a person, right? Now, John is also a person, but it's also a king. Right, so John is a king. These are relations. These are these are facts. John is a king. Richard and John are people. Now, Richard is the brother of John. Therefore, John is the brother of Richard. Now, this thing here is a crown, and this thing here, this crown, is on the head of this person, which is J. John. Right. Now, this object here is the left leg of Richard. This object here is the left leg of John. So these are how. This is how we're gonna. 
uh, dissect the world into facts and relation, object relationships. Okay. For that, we're going to have a syntax. Uh, we're going to have a syntax to to be able to set to do these kinds of things, and it's going to be the same logical syntax that we've seen before, where we can have things and other things, things or other things. We can have things in parentheses, negated things. We can have variables here. We can have constants, which are variables that never will never change the value. Um, and we will have predicates, true, false, after, loves, reigning, all these, you know, um, uh, relationships. And then we're going to have functions, which are all these facts, mother, left, leg, etc., etc. Right? And actually, these two can be facts and relationships. And we're going to have an operator presence. We're going to see the syntax in action next. Remember, we're going to have constants, which are going to be the objects, John, uh, Bobby the dog, you know, all those are constants. We're going to have predicates, which are relations for the most part, and we're going to have uh, functions which actually return a value uh, that that is not true or false. Okay, so for example, um, here, right, I will say that here Richard is the brother of John. That's how I read this. This object here is this relation of the second object. Okay? That's going to be an atomic se sentence, and I'm stating a fact here. Okay? Now, this is true or false. It's a fact, right? So you can have true or false, uh, or false um, uh, um, value, right? Now, depending on the parameters, the parameters, Predicates and functions have arity. Arity is the number of parameters that they have in there. The symbols will have an interpretation. I mean, Richard, we know who Richard is. We know who John is. We know what the brother of, of someone means. We're going to have terms. For example, uh, some object is going to be the left leg of John, right? And when we say the left leg of John, that is actually going to return a value. It's going to return that, you know, little, I think, that, that was the leg with the bump right? That's the leg, left leg of John, this guy here, okay? So the left leg of John is going to return a symbol. This is a function, okay? So that's the difference. Predicates are relations, and functions will will return a value. Uh, a clear one will be, for example, say, uh, the brother of John, right? So brother of John, this will return Richard. That's a function. I called it bro as opposed to brother just to differentiate between the function and the actual predicate, the fact. There are more complex sentences. For example, the brother R is the brother of J and J is the brother of R. Or, or another sentence could be, for example, Richard is not a king, which implies that John is a king, right? Because one of the two might be a king. These are more complicated sentences. And we're going to use universal quantifiers, like for example, for all object for all um, for all objects that are king, that implies that that object is also a person. And there's existential quantifiers. So just with one being true, this, this whole thing is true. So there exists an object that it's a crown, that is a crown. And that object X is on John's head. So the X is on the head of John, right? That's how we read these things. So this is how, how the syntax is, is working, right? So there's more complicated sentences, sentences and sentences, sentences imply sentence, and so on and so forth. If you want to know more about syntax, there's a previous video on that. All right. Now, um, let's, let's look at this. What is the interpretation for these sentences? Well, here, Richard is a king or John is a king. So either Richard is a king or John is a king. And it's not either. It's Richard is a king or John is a king. It might be both. Now here, for example, Richard's left leg is not the brother of John. That's very ridiculous, but that's what it says. Now, another thing might be, for all object X and all object Y, X 
is a brother of y, if x, uh, if x is a brother of y, that implies that x and y are siblings. Uh, Paris is in France and Marseille is in France. Uh, another one. Uh, for all object C such that, for all object C, if C is a country and C borders Ecuador, then C is in South America. Another one. There is at least one country C. There is at least one country C and C borders with Spain and C borders with Italy. Right? There's there's just a can uh, that's very literal now in plain English that says there's a country that borders both Spain and, and Italy. Now the let's do the reverse. Let's do an English sentence. For example, Richard says only two brothers, John and Jeffrey. The way to say it is we establish these names by the way. We have to come up with these names, but with the names that are that we've come up, we can say that John is a brother of Richard and Jeffrey is a brother of Richard. Remember, we have to say that Richard is only two brothers, John and Jeffrey. We took part of, we took care of John and Jeffrey being brothers of Richard. Now, they cannot be the same person. And John is not Jeffrey. And here we have to take care of this, only two brothers. And if there's not, for all objects such that that object is the brother of Richard, then if, if that object is the brother of Richard, then that object is either John or Jeffrey. Okay? That means there's no more than these two brothers of Richard. That's the only part. Let's look at another one. No region in South America borders any region in Europe. For all objects C and D such that C is in South America and D is in Europe, there's no, I mean C does not border D. That's how we would say that. And the last one. No two adjacent countries have the same map color. So in a map, no two adjacent countries have the same map color. This is how we would say. For all objects S and Y, X and Y, we have that X is a country and Y is going to such that X is a country and Y is a country and X and Y share a border. If this is all true, then the color of X is not the color of Y and the countries are not the same. X is not the same as Y. So we will start building knowledge bases with this syntax. Remember there's two operations, tell and ask, and we're going to have another one called ask bars. So we will tell a knowledge base, for example, that John is king, like this. We will tell a knowledge base that for all objects such that uh, that object is a king, then that implies that that object is also a person. We will tell it rules. So we tell the knowledge base a rule. Then we can ask things. When this is, once this is in the knowledge base, we can ask the knowledge base, hey, is, king, is John king? And this knowledge base will return true. Is there a person? And this will return true, right? But we can also ask variables. So, for example, with this ask bars operator, we ask the knowledge base, who is a person? This is what it's saying. Give me all x's such that x is a person. And it will say x can be John or x is Richard. This is called a binding list. And this is what we're going to work through, um, through next. The idea would be to try and define, try and define problems so that we can use this kind of syntax. Remember, we will build systems that will use tell, ask, and ask bars, and then we can tell it a lot of things and ask interesting questions. So, for example, just a quick, uh, quick example, kinship. The son of my father is my brother, one's grandmother is one mother, the mother of one's parent, um, my brother and my sister are my siblings, and so on and so forth. All kinds of relationship of kinship. The domain is people. We'll use unary predicates, so male, female, for example. There will be relations, parent, sibling, brother, sister, child, daughter, son, spouse, wife, husband, grandparent, grandchild, cousin, un uncle, etc. And there will be functions, mother and father. So, for example, the mother of John is going to be 
Jamie, right? That's that's a function because it returns a value. It doesn't it doesn't have a truth value. It actually returns a symbol. So with this, you come up with these things. You come up with what are the relationships, the unary predicates, the functions, and then you can say things like this: one mother's is one female parent. If you want to put that rule in the system, you will do it like this: for all objects M C the function mother's mo the mother of c will return m if and only if m is female and m is the parent of c that's one's mother's one's female parent that's the rule another rule a sibling is another child of one's parent so for all x y uh, x is a sibling of y if and only if x is not y so they're not the same person and and the parent of x is p and the parent of y is also p. Wendy is female. You just say it like this, female Wendy. These are called axioms. These define our problem. Those are axioms. Okay? And can be uh, and then also, for example, in the Wumpus world where time is part of the domain because we are moving in a game, right? In a game at time one and time two, you're in different places in the game. That can also be represented like this. So for example, you can have if the percept, right? The percept relationship at time step. So these are the percepts at time step three, for example. These are the percepts at time step six. Okay. So we can have, and, and remember, these percepts is what we were, our sensors, basically. We were sensing a stench, a breeze, glitter, none, none. We were sensing none, breeze, none, none, scream at time step six. So we can represent what we perceive like this. And then we can have actions such as um, turn, and then right, left, whatever, turn left, right, forward, shoot, grab, climb. And we can also ask the best action at time step five. We will use ask bars for that. This is the problem, right? So have the machine decide for us. We'll ask first, is there an A such that A is the best action at time step five? This is, for example, how we would decide to design the syntax to ask for a best action. And we can encode uh, more stuff, right? So for example, row percepts. So for example, uh, for all variables T, S, G, M, C, for example, if the percept, if S, B, glitter, M, C are the percepts at time T, okay, remember there's glitter, right? Then we're going to say that there's glitter at time T. So we simplify this big rule into the small rule. And then we can have actions, right? So for all T such that there's glitter at time T, then the best action is to grab at time T. So when we ask if T is 5 and there's glitter at 5, we ask, is there a best action A at time 5, A will return grab. Now, there's we can encode the adjacent squares like this. Adjacent square 1, 2, square 1, 1. Adjacent square 3, 4, square 4, 4. We can encode stuff like that. But we can also encode it more simply. And I will show you this uh, very quickly. These are, this is a very simplified Wumpus world, but say we're here in 2, 2, square 2, 2, here. We're there. And we want to find if square, for example, 3, 2 is adjacent to the first one. We can look at these many rules where all possible adjacencies are defined, or we can define this in a more general way. So for example, for all x, y, a, b, we're going to say that the square x, y is adjacent to a, b if and only if x is equal to a and y is one of these two values, b minus 1 or b plus 1, or if y is equal to b and x is either a minus 1 or x plus 1. And this works like this. Let's see if 2, 2 is adjacent to 3, 2. Basically, the circle is adjacent to the x. Well, let's say, is x equal to a in this case? Remember, x and a are the first terms in the coordinates of the square. Is x equal to a? No. So this is false. This whole expression 
is false. And we're left with the second one. Is y equal to b? Oh yeah, y, remember the second term of both coordinates, y is equal to b. Well, is x equal to a minus 1? Yes. 2 is equal to 3 minus 1. So yes, they're adjacent. If I, ha if I test another square here, for example, 4, 1, right? I will say that a, the, the first number, so the first x, 2, is not equal to 1. And then when I go here, y, so 2 again, is not equal to 4. So they both go to false. And this is how we define problems, and we can, we can put rules in there and simplify rules and put a lot of rules in our knowledge base, and then we can ask questions to it. Okay? So uh, there's a language that allows you to do this, a programming language that allows you to do this. It's called Prolog, uh, done by Alan Kalmaror uh, in 1972. There's uh, SWI Prolog there at that address, www.s wi-prolog.org. It's a free version of Prolog. And there's also a quick tutorial at uh, this URL that you can see there in your video. And that is how we will build knowledge bases. The next, um, the next video is going to talk about creating a knowledge base and doing inference on it.